back then, all these teachers would say things like, if you write down what I said, you slander me, mm, 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 you know? Mm. And then, but we're reading about it here mm, a thousand mm. years later. So I guess somebody wrote it down. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, most famous are these condensed encounters. Like, after Dharma talk, the students ask the question and Lin Chi punches him in, in the face. Those are the famous koans. But actually, Lin Chi gave a Dharma talk for maybe an hour and a, or a an half, one and a half hours. And even either that talk isn't recorded or, like, if you find a record of that talk, it turns out to be a pretty standard Dharma talk. But the only thing that we know about is this punch in the face. And for us, that's Lin Chi. And we suppose that from morning to night, he would punch his students. But um, it's just that he warned against being attached to the rational explanation, but he was not against it. You have to, well, use words to explain something. And then at the end of the day, you say, well, that's just an explanation. But the real thing is something else. Good afternoon, morning or evening, everyone out there. And welcome to another episode of the Design Exchange podcast. I'm your host, Thomas Grove, and with me today, my very special guest, Muho. Hi, nice to meet you. Muho is the former abbot of a Zen temple in Japan called Antaiji. And he's been living in Japan for 30 years, more than that? Around 30 years. Mm. And uh, most of that time as a Zen monk? Yeah, the first time I came to Japan, I was 22, and I spent one year as an exchange student. But six months out of that time, I spent at Antaiji, and later, when I came for the second time, I ordained there. So I ordained pretty soon, and then I first lived as eight, for eight years as a training monk in Antaiji. And after I got Dharma transmission from my teacher and was a teacher in my own right, I left the temple and lived in a park in Osaka for six months. But then my teacher died and I was called back to Antaiji. And then I lived for 20 years as the abbot. But I wasn't a monk in the strict sense because I married and had children. And I was the abbot of Antaiji until two years ago. And now I'm... Here in Osaka, I'm living here with my family, but I still have no other job description rather than, well, Zen monk or Zen teacher <laughs> or whatever you want to call it. So, yeah, basically all of those 30 years in Japan I spent in Zen training or Zen practice. Uh, I came to know about you because I searched Google for Osaka Zazenkai, mm, mm. which would be like a Zazen group, a group of people wanting to do seated meditation. And uh, one of your many videos popped up of people sitting, <laughs> doing meditation at Osaka Castle. Mm. And I, I wrote a comment and you replied to the comments. Mm. And that was uh, nearly a year and a half ago. Mm. Mm. And then from February of last year until now, I've been going uh, to sit in meditation on the walls of Osaka Castle <laughs> as, as often as the weather permits. Yeah. Uh, so thank you for uh, letting me train with you. Yeah, thank you for coming. Yeah, well, mm. It's like this. <laughs> 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 um, okay, my first question is, mm. what's the number one misconception about Zen? from a foreigner perspective or even maybe a Japanese perspective? Mm. I mean, you could say in a way all conceptions about Zen are misconceptions. That's why it's so hard to answer to the question, what is Zen? Give me the true answer. I've heard all these misconceptions now, please, Muho, give me the true answer. What is Zen? I mean, I can tell you a lot about the history of Zen, but people don't want to know don't want to know that. They want to know, well, the real thing. But 
What is it? But I mean, maybe what you're trying to ask, misconception of Zen. When te people uh, talk about Zen in the West, there's these expressions like uh, having a Zen moment. Or in French, there's obviously a phrase, rester Zen, keep Zen, stay Zen, which means keep quiet or chill or something like that. So, for a lot of people, Zen means relaxation in the West. And maybe that's part of it, but Zen is certainly not just chilling. Um, in Japan, on the other hand, often you have that image of uh, Zen monks kind of... Mm, sitting until late at night and whenever somebody falls asleep he gets a good whack with a stick. So Zen is either something for young boys that were born in a temple and they have to inherit their father's temple and they have to go through that training to be allowed uh, to become priest in the future. Or it's something for people who did something bad and to show their remorse. They would enter a temple and go through that kind of training. So in Japan, often people have, like for example, I often got uh, this kind of, uh, how do you say, surprised feedback from Japanese when I tell them I came to Japan to practice Zen. They say, well, what did you do wrong? Why? <laughs> why? 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 <laughs> why would you want to do that? <laughs> exactly. Um, especially young people. They have the idea it's something that maybe old people do or maybe uh, parents, they send their kids to a temple when they don't want to listen to the to the parents. So that would be obviously an, a misconception that, that Zen is kind of a form of punishment. Um, on the other hand, this kind of relaxation thing is also a misconception um, because uh, relaxation needs to be balanced with a, a good amount of concentration and that also means an amount of tension. There's no, no tension in Zen. There, there's a good amount of tension as well. It's, it's a balance between being too relaxed and too tense. Um, and apart from that, I, I could imagine there's lots of misconceptions, but mm, maybe those are the most popular ones. Mm. I can't imagine why someone would do Zen if it wasn't something they wanted to do. Mm, mm, mm. The road between it being painful and mm. useful is a steep road, I yeah, think. Yeah. <laughs> Right, you have to go through a lot of suffering before you get any kind of. Mm, mm, mm. Well, I was about to say something useful from it, but mm, uh, mm, mm. but there's a, a quote you uh, you like to always. Yeah, Zen is good for nothing. Is a famous quote that's often cited in my tradition. Zen is good for nothing, and until your practice is really good for nothing. It's just good for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so it's important that it's good for nothing, uh. that you don't turn it into a game, that you don't try to gain points, that you don't want to up your game, that everybody's talking about upping their game today, uh, becoming better at playing the game. And Zen means to quit that game, take a break from that game. So a lot of people have the idea, okay, if I practice for a year or two, I get more Zen, more relaxed, or maybe even enlightened or whatever. But uh, Zen means to even quit that enlightenment game, relaxation game, and just sit and see what happens. I think as a, uh, in, my, in my own personal experience, uh, my f first real interaction with Buddhism was a, History of Buddhism 101 college course, mm, 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 mm. which was mostly focused on 
Theravada and the old school, like the life of the Buddha and the very early history. Mm. It didn't touch very much on Mahayana, maybe just in the last week or something of the class, because it's like the first class. And one of the concepts that they had taught, mm. which uh, made a big impression on me at the time, yeah. and this is the first time I've thought about it in 20 years since then. <laughs> and, uh, uh, I, and I've never really seen it brought up again, maybe because I've been in a Zen tradition ever since then. But what was an idea of a game in, of sorts that within the Hindu backdrop yeah. of uh, early Buddhism, you had like karma. Mm, mm. And in some sense, karma was like a point system Yes. As it was described to me in this class, anyways. Yeah. Where um, if you could do enough training or or perhaps do enough good deeds, mm -hmm. you would be improving your karma, which is going to uh, perhaps in your next lifetime mm -hmm. make it easier to mm -hmm. attain mm -hmm. enlightenment or something. Yeah. yeah. But just that there was some kind of system. Mm -hmm. And as somebody who's played games, mm -mm. some kind of system that you could mm -mm. work towards, mm -mm. Uh, I found interesting and compelling. Mm -mm. And it made me say, oh, well, maybe I should find some place to meditate. Mm -mm -mm. So I think it's interesting that your reasons for starting Zen training mm -mm. are uh, probably very different than your reasons for continuing Zen training. Probably. Because I don't mm. care about karma points mm. <laughs> anymore. Mm. 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 Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. I think what you said is, is, is pretty interesting. And it's something that I've been also thinking about recently quite a lot because I am just started to write about this idea of Zen meaning to quit the game. Um, what you said about this uh, Hinduist idea of karma is, is pretty much, as you said, it's like a board game. You kind of try to improve your karma, and when your karma improve, improves, mm, you get ahead, you collect these points. In the next life, you move up on a, on a higher stage, and the game will be more enjoyable on the higher stage. And if you collect even more karma, you go even higher. And then the Buddhist idea or kind of the Buddhists started as asking themselves, well, but then where do we get in the end? And the answer is, there's no end. You're going to play that game forever and ever. It's going to repeat itself eternally. And with any game you play, you don't want to play it forever. You want to play it as long as it's fun, but you want to take a rest. But kind of in this karma idea, there's, there's no end. So the Buddhists started with saying, well, okay, rebirth for one time, a second time, that's nice, but I don't want to repeat that game forever and ever. There must be a way out. And that's basically what the Buddha tried. And people say he had success in finding nirvana. And nirvana means not some special stage, but nirvana means the game is over. There's no second time after this. So in a way, that's what maybe most people, modern people think when we die. There's nothing after that. So we modern people suppose uh, we all will attain nirvana after we die. But at the time of the Buddha, most people thought, no, there's going to be rebirth and... If that's going to continue forever, it's hell, basically. Yeah, It's hell, so we want to get out of that. But then what the original Buddhists, or maybe it was what the Theravada Buddhists did after that, is basically they turned this idea of tain, attaining nirvana into another game. Now it's not about collecting karma points, but it's about kind of getting free from karma. And... Uh, slowly but gradually um, erasing your delusions, getting rid of desire. And then there are certain stages. So I forgot 
the names, but uh, at one point you reach the stage of a sotopanna, I think it's called, a stream enterer. And a stream enterer is somebody who will quit the game in, I don't know, maximum of seven re rebirths. So a sotopanna has already entered the stream that leads out of the game. And to achieve that stage, you have to, I forgot, out of 10 desires or so, you have to get rid of three or so. And then if you get rid of another two or three, you reach level three from the top. I forgot the name, but I think that's somebody who's returning once to the human life. I think that person is supposed to be born in the heavenly realms once and then to return to the human realm another time. And then the second level from the top is somebody who's going to return, I think, never to the human realm. He's going to go to the heavenly realm. I'm not quite sure. Actually, to me, it, <laughs> it, it stops making sense at that point. The highest level, anyway, is the, the Arahat. Uh -huh. Arahat or uh, Arahant, I think it's called in Mahayana Buddhism. That's a completely enlightened being that has let go of all desires and delusions. And uh, the Arhat, after that person dies, will attain Nirvana, which means that person is not going to return into this world. And uh, Theravada Buddhists, rather than trying to improve their karma, they are aiming at reaching our hardship. But from my perspective, the perspective of a Mahayana Buddhist, I ask myself, okay, uh, you play a different game now, but it's still a game. And actually not so much has changed. Before you try to gain good karma points for yourself, now you try to get enlightened points for yourself. You try to get out of samsara, samsara being the word for this the word for this world of suffering. You try to get out of suffering and into nirvana, but basically not so much has changed from the Hindu idea, except that mm, improving the karma has changed for trying to get closer to nirvana. And Mahayana is different in the way that we say you are already in nirvana. There's nothing more to gain. You are already there. You are already there in nirvana. It's just that you don't realize it because in your mind you're still playing the game. You still want to either improve your karma or you're looking for nirvana somewhere outside on the higher stage. Um, so in Mahayana, we not only stop trying to improve the karma, we also stop trying to reach our hardship, trying to reach nirvana after we die. But rather, we ask ourselves, well, what is missing right now? What is missing? We always have this feeling there's something missing. That's what we call suffering, dukkha. It's not uh, something that crushes us necessarily. Suffering means this feeling, but there's still something missing. There's still something missing. I would rather have a new iPhone. I would rather have a new girlfriend. I would rather play a new game, whatever. But what is really missing in this moment? And at one point you realize actually there's nothing missing. There's nothing missing. And that's nirvana, attaining nirvana in samsara. And maybe even that thought, but I would rather eat some ice cream now, for example. Maybe that thought is still there and it's okay. Sometimes you allow yourself to eat that ice cream, sometimes you don't. But even that thought, something is missing, is part of nirvana. It's okay. It's okay that it's there. And that's what I call quitting the game. Um, not trying to gain points and also not trying to somehow reach a different place that would be outside the game, but rather to find peace in the game without needing to collect points. 
without needing to up your game or whatever. What do you think about the... Uh, I think there's a sense that in, uh, <laughs> in Zen, the stories basically... The Buddha was also essentially a Zen master. Hmm. Say the first Zen master, right? Yeah, yeah. But, um, you know, he explained things in a slightly different way because of the hmm. cu cultural context. But that the holding up of the lotus flower during that one sermon is proof that he, that mm -mm. of like a direct transmission of in mm. the moment experience mm. uh how much do you think that's true versus how much do you think that's revisionist to like mm. try to claim some sort of legitimacy for this philosophy I mean that that story of the Buddha holding up a flower and transmitting the Dharma to his students I mean that was made up in China that's not a uh, story that would be kind of historically valid. Um, so, yeah, of course, uh, there's a lot of this storytelling that happened afterwards. I think especially the Chinese had um, a strong desire to almost like like a family lineage. They're like, uh, this is Patriarch number one, that's Shakyamuni, and then it was transmitted to Makakasho, Mahakashapa, and then to Ananda. And they invented all these stories. But I think a few, if any, have any kind of historical kind of evidence that it actually happened like that. So, I mean, everybody turns the Buddha into, well, what they like him to be. For example, for the Pure Land Buddhists, Shakyamuni basically appeared to tell us that there's an even better Buddha, like Amitabha. It was basically Shakyamuni's job to tell people that they can also take refuge in Amitabha and that they don't even have to practice because Amitabha will save them. Or for the Nichiren Buddhists, uh, basically, Shakyamuni, whatever he did before he preached the Lotus Sutras, that was just, um, well, we, we sometimes say skillful means, but what he really wanted to preach is the Lotus Sutra, or some would even go so far to say that it was the Lotus Sutra that became flesh in Shakyamuni. And because the Lotus Sutra realized people were not ready yet to hear the Lotus Sutra, it would first start with teaching the Pali Sutras and then uh, the Wisdom Sutras and the Flower Ornament Sutras. And only when people were ready to hear the Lotus Sutra, the Lotus Sutra would manifest. So everybody uh, invents their own Shakyamuni. And in a way, we do it in Zen as well. So in Zen we would say the Shakyamuni tried hard for six years to get rid of his suffering, but then when he sat under the Bodhi tree, he stopped even that game, reaching for enlightenment, escaping suffering. He just sat there after he received that, um, what's the English word? He received a bowl of gruel made with milk, which was something that an ascetic wasn't supposed to eat in India at the time. So actually the friends of Shakyamuni that had practiced with him, he had five friends that uh, practiced with him, he left him. They left him because they, they said, oh, Shakyamuni, he gave up. You're not hardcore enough for us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's not hardcore anymore. He's <laughs> eating this milk gruel. But he, he took that bowl and he sat under the tree and as a Zen practitioner, we don't really know, we don't find in the sutras what he did under the tree, what kind of meditation. Um, but in Zen, we, or I, I would suppose, he just let go of everything, even of this idea, I need to get out of suffering. He just sat there after he had that bowl, and then a couple of days later, he saw the morning star and... He realized, well, what I just said, nothing is missing. What was I looking for in the first place? It's all here. It's all here. The morning star, me sitting here on the Bodhi tree. 
Nirvana is already manifesting here. And to transmit that teaching, he had to use words and he taught all these sutras. But from the Zen perspective, um, what is most important in the life of the Buddha is his own example. Him sitting down under the Bodhi tree and after that traveling through India to um, give the teaching with the words, but then also he would be sitting with the students. So in Zen, uh, we try to learn from the words as well, but what is most important is to sit just like the Buddha did. If the Buddha found the answer through sitting, why would we just look in the sutras for the answer? So the sutras are kind of the explanation book or the tutorial in a way. But Zazen, just sitting, is kind of finding out what the thing is through, well, user experience, so to speak. Do you think that <clears throat> one of the reasons why... I'm, I'm, I'm just going to make a statement that it's, it's kind of stupid, but I mean, I, I don't have any... Uh, I don't have anything to back up what I'm about to say. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, but it might make for an interesting conversation. So, mm, mm. do you think the reason why Zen is so popular in the West, mm. I don't know if it is, that's the thing. I, mm. Is it popular? I'm not sure. Mm -hmm, mm. But do you think the reason is Zen is so popular in the West is because of exactly what you're saying? Um, because in the West, we have the, mm. the Judeo-Christian traditions. Yes, yes. Where it's not really about your own effort at all. It's mm -hmm. the other help. Mm, kind mm. of system yes. where just professing your faith alone is enough to gain entrance into heaven. Yes. And if that's not resonating with you, mm. this other tradition that uh, comes along, you discover this other tradition of Buddhism or maybe Zen where the oftentimes the, uh, the framework is of using your own faculties of awareness to make your own discoveries mm. as opposed to dogmatically believing on some teaching that's been passed down mm. <clears throat> is that is the uh the modern world's proclivity towards science like the scientific method mm. Mm. why zen is popular in the west if it is popular indeed Mm, I guess the short answer is yes. Uh, I mean, the longer answer is just as you said, there's two questions here. Is Zen really so popular? And then the other answer, well, if it is popular, why is it popular? And, and where, are, where are the students? <laughs> yeah, I, I think it got really popular in the West about 60 years ago. Like there's a Japanese guy called D.T. Suzuki who went to America almost or oh, more than 100 years ago. Uh, he came f to America for the first time. He married an American woman. He wrote many books in English on Zen, even before the Second World War. But it really kind of clicked with the Americans after the Second World War. I think in the 50s it were the beatniks, but then were the hippies who kind of really started to uh, jump on that idea. And the reasons are what you just said. For one thing, in Zen you almost have no dogma. Basically, you have these uh, Zen monks who indulge in burning the sutras or wiping their asses with it. You kind of, well, you shit on the Holy Scripture. While in both Christianity and Judaism, the Holy Scripture is holy. You don't shit on it. You don't burn it. Um, so that seemed to be cool for a lot of people. It's not about dogma, but about reality itself, whatever that reality is. Um, another thing I, that is, I think, important is the physical aspect. I think around the same time also yoga became extremely popular in the West. And uh, the yoga tradition and Zen are kind of diff different, but... Uh, for 
both the body, the physical experience, is essential, while in Christianity it doesn't really matter in what, which posture you pray, for example. Prayer is something that happens in, in your soul. Your, your soul needs to connect to God. And uh, when you look at the history of Christianity, you find all these people, they actually made a point of tormenting themselves while um, doing a pilgrimage, for example, putting peace into their shoes. So to inflict physical harm on themselves. And it's kind of a, a kind of mind versus body thing. The more you torment your body, the higher your mind will rise. And the more you indulge in physical pleasures, the more your mind will be, whatever, hijacked by, by the devil or whatever. And both in yoga and Zen, you have more of a harmony like that. Like practice goes through the body or manifests in the body. Uh, it's not a mind versus body thing, but body and mind are one, is something that we often say in Zen. And I think that resonated with a lot of people or especially like the 60s sexual liberation like sexuality is a difficult topic in buddhism because outside of japan monks are not supposed to practice sex and to have children but in japan um, you can have children and so this physical aspect probably also resonated with this we need to get rid of this kind of for example uh, how do you say, um, idea in Christianity that sexuality is something that, uh, well, of course, we need it for humanity to survive, but uh, not before you marry. And then when you marry, it's, you, you do it behind closed doors and uh, don't talk about it. Um, and the hippies, they wanted to kind of have a positive positive relationship to their body, to their sexuality, and it seemed that Zen was also playing into that. Um, but then, to come back to the first question, how popular is Zen in the West? Like, I'm surprised then when I come back, when I go back to Germany, I'm 54 now, and when I started to practice, I was 16 in the 80s, there were a lot of young people in the Zen groups, a lot of people in their 20s, 30s. Now, when I go back to Germany, I find many people my age in their 50s, 60s. And when I ask them since when they practice, basically a lot of them are practicing since 1980s. So it's still the same guys, but they just got, old, got older. And when I ask them, where are the young guys? And there are some young guys, but it seems that uh, compared to the 80s, compared to 30 years ago, 40 years ago, a lot of people are now more interested in Theravada or Tibetan Buddhism, which kind of surprises me because you have more of a dogma there, clear rules. Um, but it could also be that maybe young people are a little bit tired of this kind of hippie, flowery thing that, oh, there's no dogma, just do what you want, just relax, chill. While in both Theravada, uh, it's pretty clear-cut. There are certain things that are okay and others that are not okay. While in Zen, mostly everything is okay. And in Tibet, you have a lot, a large variety of things. Uh, lots of options, practices. It's, kind of, it's more like a tailor-made thing. It's also very colorful. You have the mandalas. Uh, I don't know, maybe it's also more compatible to modern drugs. I don't know this. In the West, also the kind of the history of Zen and Buddhism is also kind of drug history. There's been a lot of talk about can drugs help you in attaining enlightenment. My point of view, the traditional point of view of Zen is uh, forget about it. It's, it's not about having experiences in the first place. So drugs don't help you, but um, maybe people who only know this hippie Zen have also the image of these kind of uh, pot-smoking Zen practitioners, and that's not so cool anymore, maybe today. Uh, I, maybe as uh, psychedelics become more legalized, mm. Mm. perhaps uh, there'll mm. be a Zen resurgence. <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe. <laughs> 
Uh, but you know, it's not if if, oh. if 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 you're maybe it's like you grew up with your your parents practicing Zen. You're like, I don't want to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. Kind of Zen. I think it, it turned a little bit old in the West. Uh, it's a little bit 60s, 70s. Uh. Huh. I mean, I, I started in my like like 20 ish, mm -mm. but before that, I was doing Shaolin Kung Fu from mm -mm. 12 or something. So yes, yes. there's some kind of, you know, I saw that movie uh, Kung Fu with David Carradine. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've mm -hmm. ever watched that. That's called Kung. It's a pretty famous movie. But like the first half of the movie is just him training in a monastery. Um, and before he could leave the monastery, he had to like, take this cauldron of hot coals and carry it with his arms to like put it on this plate that would open the temple door so he could leave mm. the temple. Mm -hmm. <laughs> as far as I know, they don't actually do that at the, at the Shaolin Temple. <laughs> but, um, you know, mm -hmm. I... I, I was really into Kung Fu and I was like, oh, what's this relationship between mm. Kung Fu and Buddhism? I, mm -mm. Mm -mm. You know, so even before, that might be why it, I thought it would be fun to study it at university because it's like, ah, oh, what is this connection? But yeah, I, from my perspective, I don't have any ideas why it may not be popular for young people because mm. when mm. I was young, mm. I was into it. Mm. <laughs> you know? mm. and, uh, I keep asking my son if he wants to join me mm -mm. to wake up at 5.15 on a Sunday morning to go practice Zen. And um, he never uh, takes me up on the invitation. Yeah, You have <laughs> children. They don't practice. No, no, no. no. They are not interested. <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, oh, well. I mean, um, whether or not Zen is popular, mm -mm. it uh, doesn't it doesn't change the fact that they're already they're already enlightened <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> whether they practice or don't practice it doesn't change that mm -hmm. aspect mm. um okay here's my next question uh first some background for the audience there's this thing in zen called dharma transmission mm, mm, mm sometimes uh, called Inkan. Is that the mm. same as Inkan? Receiving Inka Inkan? Inka Shome is a phrase that's used, in, used, I think, in Rinzai, but sometimes in Soto. But normally what you mean when you say Dharma transmission is Shiho in Japanese. And Inka Shome, I think, doesn't exist in Soto anymore, except for a few teachers that went to Rinzai Masters and got their Inka mm. uh, from Rinzai. But in Soto, it's Shiho. That's usually meant when you use the word. And uh, as far as I know, what this Dharma transition is, means is let's say a um, monk has been practicing and then they had an experience which you might label enlightenment they became enlightened so they go to their teacher or they find a master who's uh who other people seem to agree is enlightened and they ask for uh, verification or validity to their enlightenment mm. Mm. now my question is Seeking somebody's approval for your enlightenment seems like the least Zen thing you could do. But there's all these stories mm -hmm. of like uh, really famous, super famous monks in the in the history of, of Japanese Zen, mm. like sending letters to China or going on pilgrimages to China to try to get some Chinese master to give them a, a stamp of approval to say, yeah, you had an enlightenment. Mm. But the Buddha didn't go to anybody for his stamp mm. of approval. Mm. 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 <laughs> So it just seems like it's weird that there's so many examples of of uh, these historical figures going to great lengths to mm. get mm. their stamp of approval. When uh, it, it there's there there also is in Zen some sense of um, anti-establishment or anti-authority, and mm -hmm. the, the times mm -hmm. that Zen mm -hmm. has been the most alive mm. are the mm. times when it's not been favored by the government or not mm. been favored by the you know when it's in the most disrepair that's when you get 
uh, tea ceremony or, or mm-hmm. flower arrangement mm-hmm. or something, mm-hmm. kind of coming out of the mud. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and searching for validity from some establishment guy seems mm-hmm. against that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's an important topic topic what is dharma transmission what is transmitted in the first place is there something that the teacher transmits to the student or is there something that the student has gained by himself some kind of enlightenment experience and the teacher just affirms that yeah you got it i got it too and now we're dharma friends or whatever (laughs) Is that kind of uh, transmission or, or affirmation important? If yes, why? If not, why do people do it in the first place? Uh, first of all, in at least in the lineage where I practice, it's not so much about the experience experiences that you gain. So it's not that you knock on the door of a teacher and say, "Hey, last night during meditation, I had this and this experience." Is that What Dogen was talking about is that what the Buddha had and your teacher says, oh, no, 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 you need another two or three years. Or he says, oh, you, now you got it and you get the stamp and the paper and you leave. Um, of course, uh, when you meditate, you also have some kind of, well, realizations and uh, certain things change. But part of the practice, a good part of the practice is to implement that in daily life. So it's not about the experiences that you can tell about. It's about what it does with you. And... So in Antaiji, when you go there, uh, what I was told, was what probably everybody is told is, uh, well, first sit for 10 years. Forget about enlightenment, forget about Dharma transmission, sit for 10 years. And then after 10 years, sit for another 10 years. And when you sit for 20 years, give it another 10 years. You should be willing to just sit for 30 years. And usually in Antaji, people have their Dharma transmission after 10 years, but there's no rule that you can will get it after 10 years or after seven years or eight years or whatever. Uh, it's just that when you uh, share the life in the community with the teacher, it's a little bit like uh, Dogen who started Soto Zen in Japan, he used the metaphor of walking in the mist. So when you walk in the mist, you get wet over time without realizing it. And at one point you realize, oh, I'm soaking wet. But that's not the point when Dharma transmission happens in a way. It's you got wet all the time. And just because you realize you're wet doesn't mean, oh, now it's time to go home and dry my clothes. You continue walking. That's the practice. You walk in the mist in the mist, and 10 years, 10 years, 10 years. Actually, there's no end to it. But at one point, your teacher might tell you, well, now you can walk on your own feet. You don't need my help anymore. And you can also guide others like Dharma transmission doesn't just mean that, oh, that guy is enlightened. It means uh, he can guide students. So um, there's a lot of responsibility, both on the student and also on the teacher, when this happens because the teacher authorizes a student to basically guide people in his name. Um, Is it possible that people attain enlightenment and do genuine practice without having dharma transmission without being affirmed by an authentic teacher of course it's uh, possible you named shakyamuni buddha he wasn't authenticized by anybody he didn't have dharma transmission uh, by anybody but uh, this how do you say custom of giving dharma transmission or of of receiving Dharma transmission from a teacher, I think it still has a meaning. For example, you could uh, make a comparison to being a doctor of medicine. You're practicing medicine. Um, Maybe you went to medical school. Maybe you have your diploma. Does it mean you're a good doctor? 
Not necessarily. You could have your degree from some uh, degree mill in the Caribbean and uh, that doesn't mean you're a good doctor or you could even be have been to medical school in Harvard. It doesn't mean you're a good doctor. Uh, on the other hand, uh, maybe you never studied at a university and you're still a good doctor. It's possible. But, I mean, if I would go to a doctor, I would be a little bit more, how do you say, feel secure if I know oh, that guy actually studied and he finished his course at medical school. It doesn't mean he's a good doctor. It's not the only thing I would look at. But to make sure that there's not too much crooks out there and there's a lot in the spiritual scene even even in the zen scene there's lots of people that say i'm a zen master i'm a i don't know life coach uh, i'm a um, how do you say motivation trainer and also i'm a zen master i got my enlightenment experience here and there there's so many people out there that i think having dharma transmission is good it's not the only thing that you need and mm, not every Dharma transmission is the same, just as a degree from Harvard is not the same as from, I don't know, St. Martin's College on the Bahamas or whatever you have there. But um, like in Antaiji, investing 10 years into the practice I think there's there's a point to it. There's a point to it to not just go there for half a year. You think you got it. The problem with this kind of not going to the teacher because how can the teacher judge my enlightenment experience? It's my experience. I know best if I'm enlightened or not. If I don't know it, how would my teacher know it? If I'm not quite so sure about the genuine genuity of my practice. The fact that I go to the teacher already shows I'm not enlightened. And there's a point to that. But on the other hand, just because I think I'm a Buddha, that's not proof that I'm a go Buddha. There's a lot of people out there that think they're the Messiah. They know best. God knows and they know. Is that a proof that they are Messiah? I'm not quite so sure. So that's a problem with enlightenment uh, experiences. A lot of people have them. Maybe just taking LSD gets you that kind of experience. And you think you can fly and everything. Um, you're chosen to save the world. And nobody, nobody can take you, talk you out of that. But that's dangerous. That's dangerous. So I think it's quite healthy to have this kind of how do you say peer review in a way? It's, a, it's kind of peer review, going to a teacher, listening to his feedback. And he, if that teacher says, oh, maybe you should say, sit for another decade, then you do that. Might be quite helpful. My, uh, my favorite monk is EQ. Mm, mm. My, I, I consider him my patron saint. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> it, it, it could be that like uh, mm. I... I you know, maybe I practice then, or maybe I I uh, mm. chose EQ as my patron saint because I want justifications for my bad behaviors. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, mm. but the story with him was like he he went to one master mm. and and the master said uh, that's only the level of arahat. That's not even mm. bodhisattva. And mm. he's and then EQ is like arahat's good enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm not being antisocial. I'm 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 trying to read questions <laughs> that were that were sent to me. You never Discord. know with phones these days, you uh. know. Um, Discord, but that means something like disharmony, isn't it? Or what? What's the meaning yeah, of Discord? Yeah, yes, or it could be re related to the word discourse. Ah, discourse. But it, but it's written discord. Discord. I, I don't know why. Discord. Uh, maybe it's not a word in the first place. Oh. Be, I, I, being, I always assumed that the that it was in reference to discourse, like a conversation. Discourse, huh? Being in discord with something, that's not a phrase that you have. Being no, in discord. It, it makes sense to me, like unharmonious. Oh, 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 oh. oh. Um, 
Mm. Of course, being that this is the internet. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that that, that's, the, that, that, that's the default state. Yeah. <laughs> that's, the, that's the state you are supposed to be in. <laughs> oh man, there's so many other things I want to talk to beyond talk about beyond these questions here. But uh, oh but, yeah, but, but, go, uh, go but, ahead. But let's go for these questions quickly. Mm. Uh, real basic one mm -hmm. from I, I think like a 16 year old girl. I'm not really sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. Mm. What is a Zen master? Good question. What is a Zen master? Um, maybe the word master has a different ring in English than in German. In German we have the word Meister. And for example, to become a baker, you have to be a, a baker Meister. You have to master bakery. Uh, or to paint walls which is not really the hardest job, but first you have to make a three years apprenticeship and then you're a painter master. And basically you could say that's uh, the same with the Zen master. You go through the training in a monastery until you get your Dharma transmission. And maybe you could also say it's, it's a little bit like becoming professor at a university. And um, from my experience, it were the smart students that quit university after one or two years and started their own business enterprise. The smart students wouldn't wait for four years until they graduate. Uh, then the students that were not so smart, but still smart, they graduated, found a job. And those who couldn't find a job, they went to graduation school and did their masters. And if they still couldn't find a job and didn't want to work as taxi drivers or bartenders, they would make their PhD. And then after 10, 20, 30 years, they ended up being professors. And in a way, if you don't leave the monastery, you will end up as a Zen master by necessity. You will be a Zen master after a decade or two in a Zen monastery if you don't have the guts to jump and <laughs> leave the monastery and do something in the real world. Anybody who can or who wants to stay a decade or two in a Zen monastery will probably end up a Zen master sooner or later. Okay, the next couple questions come from my friend Gil. Gil? Yeah, he's about mm. my age. Do you read science fiction? No, for some reason I was never really into science fiction. Uh, neither science fiction novels, also not uh, movies. I never watched a Star Trek or what's the other thing? Star Wars. Star Wars. Uh, I'm kind of the generation that watched these movies, but somehow never really. Um, also, maybe because I'm, I'm a scientifically thinking guy, so I was always into physics, mathematics. Whenever I read such a novel and I find something, oh, that, that doesn't really make sense, then it's hard for me to motivate, to motivate me to read the novel to the end. Like, like time travel, um, I travel back in time 10 years. And then I meet myself 10 years younger, or what, what was it, back to the future, I meet my mother. But how is it possible? I, I mean, if I am moving 10 years back, I should be 10 years younger myself. And I should have the memory and the consciousness of my 10 years younger or 20 years younger self. So I shouldn't be even realizing that I'm doing a time travel. So actually sitting right now here with you, actually maybe I'm time traveling from the future or from... I wouldn't be able to know, right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> then of be. course it's not so interesting for, for a novel or for a movie. It's interesting if I can now somehow change the future because I already know there's going to be a world war in the future by, by killing you, for example, because I know you're an evil guy. I will change the future and everything, everybody's going to be happy. But it doesn't make really sense from whatever point of view. So no, uh, sorry, but I was ne never really into science fiction. I saw this, I don't even remember the name of it, but th there was some 
TV series and probably a book where the guy keeps desperately tra time traveling back mm -hmm. to try to stop the assassination of JFK. And no matter what he tries, he can't change the history. Like he keeps trying, mm. goes back and eventually, you know, eventually um, he becomes an old man doing this <laughs> obsessively and, and never su succeeds. <laughs> it was kind of my favorite take on it, I guess. Um, what is something or the last thing that made you laugh out loud? Didn't we have any laughs today? Yeah, we laughed. <laughs> we laughed. We laughed. <laughs> But what uh, did we laugh about? I appeared on the radio a couple of days ago and had a good laugh. Uh, actually, the guy with whom I had an interview was a comedian. And... Um, It was on the radio. People had sent us questions. One of those questions was from a woman that um, in the evening she wanted to uh, chant the Ranis, which is kind of not Zen, but more kind of esoteric Buddhism. She loved to chant the Ranis, but whenever she was chant chanting the Rani, um, her mother-in-law also would come and wanted to talk to her. And she felt that disturbed her practice. And I said something like, well, maybe the Dharani sent you your mother-in-law. Maybe you should not only seek the Buddha through mm. chanting the Dharani, but maybe the Buddha appeared in the form of your mother-in-law. Maybe you should ch change your perspective. Then the comedian said something like, ah, that reminds me when I was 14 years old and I just discovered these adult videos that my father had kept somewhere in a closet. <laughs> so so I, would, <laughs> I would wait until my parents had gotten asleep. I would take out the videos and put them in. And I think the name was kind of, uh, I don't know, playing with the Dharani ladies or something. <laughs> But whatever, I, I just reached the good point that my father would walk down the stairs. And <laughs> that's what you try to say, Mr. Nelke. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's, <laughs> that's pretty funny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> what language do you use as your inner voice? What language do I use as my inner voice? It's a funny expression, using as an inner voice. I mean, inner voices are not something that I use. Like, like there is voices or kind of thoughts coming up in my head. And mm, those used to be German, of course. But after living in Japan for a couple of months... It switched to Japanese whenever I was in a Japanese environment. Um, but after I became the abbot in Antaishi, there were also lots of German visitors, English-speaking visitors, so I had to kind of speak in three languages. And both, for example, at night when I dream or in Zazen when these thoughts come up. And that's why kind of I have difficulties with the idea using as your inner voice because thoughts come up thoughts come up in my mind i develop them these can be english sometimes um not so much because i don't speak so much english but now i'm doing daily videos in german i get all these comments in german so now i'm thinking much more in german but also in japanese for example if i'm working on a book in japanese i'm thinking about the things I want to write in Japanese. Um, so from day to day or even during the day, it, it's different. It, it's uh, even like when we sit on a Sunday uh, for one hour, we're not supposed to think, of course. But as you know, there's lots of thoughts coming up and some of these might be in Japanese, others might be in German. There might be even some English thought fragments. Like after I have a conversation like this with you, there's also stuff from the conversation coming up again. And maybe, oh, maybe I should have said that or <laughs> stuff like that. And of course, that comes up in, in English. I would have been really smart if I said, I would have sounded really smart if I had said this instead. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Does a circle end? Does a circle That's end? That's Skill's last question. I guess no. Does a circle end? Okay. 
let's move on to Tomo, my friend Tomo, mm. also the same age as me. Uh, does the ego slash witness slash whatever reside all over the brain? Can there be a split where the mind splits into separate minds that aren't linked t together? Can I come back once more to the question of the circle? I guess a circle <laughs> has no ends, but what is important is you need to start. You need to start to draw the circle. There's no end to it, but you have to start now. That's more important than to ask yourself, well, but when, when is going to be the end or is there end or not? Right. Uh. Can you read Tomo's question once so, more? Well, the, the ego slash I, I whatever. Like, I like what you're saying. So in this particular mm. circle, there's no end to a circle, but there is a start. Yeah. And the start is always now. Okay. Mm. It's kind of an eternal start, so to speak. Mm. It's an endless or, yeah, an endless start, so to speak. You always start now, now, now. I mean, people have been saying that all the time when they say today is the first day of the rest of your life. Basically, that's the idea. Uh, you, you always have the start right now. And well, in the case of life, there is an end. We don't know what's coming afterwards, but let's suppose modern world, world, is, world view is true. And uh, the day when you die is the end. There's nothing after that, but until then you start 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 and with a circle i don't see an end you're always living here and now but mm, the question is do you really live here and now if not then you sh need to start now start to live here and now mm. is an enso a circle that's that Zen mm. painting mm. of a of I mean, that a was, uh, what, circle. That's what I was thinking of when when you read the question. Does the circle have an end? Well, the end. So sometimes it's an open circle. Like like sometimes people make a point of not connecting the start to the end. So then, in theory, that space just before that open piece would be the end. But I think that's not the point of the end. So I think also the idea. In the end, so there's no end, but maybe people don't connect it to make obvious, but there's the start. You see very clearly where the people, the person who draw that end, so put the brush in the beginning. And then you draw that circle. There's no end to that. Of course, <laughs> you don't go like this round and round, but when you live your life, that's basically what you do and you start in each moment you mm. start, there's a new start. But yeah, there's no end. There's no end. I uh, I went to a, I mean, I was at a session once and uh, presiding Roshi was this man named um, Dogen Hosokawa, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. originally from Tenryuji, but he was the abbot at Chozenji in Hawaii. Mm, 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 mm. And uh, he gave a Dharma talk about what I guess he called the Shugyo model of education. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He said in the West, the education model is first you learn A, then B, mm -hmm. then C, D, mm -hmm. E, F, G, mm -hmm. H, I. And you mm -hmm. keep adding mm -hmm. to your knowledge. Mm -hmm. But he said uh, in the East, the Shugyo model of education is you do A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, and you just refine it mm, 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 refining mm, that mm, more and more mm. uh it reminds me of what you've just said yeah yeah <laughs> i see the connection the repetitiveness can be boring as well but mm, there's mm, some meaning to it i think tomo's question was uh does consciousness exist all over the brain and is there a, and mm. is it possible that your personality could or your, your consciousness could split into different uh, consciousnesses that were not actually aware of each other or communicating with each other? I think that's what he meant. Mm. Let me read. Let me read his words specifically one mm. more time, just so I know. 
does the ego reside all over the brain? Uh, can there be a split where the mind splits into separate minds that aren't linked together? Hmm. Does the ego spread all over the brain? And can you somehow split it so that there's different egos, so to speak, in one brain? Uh, interesting question, but I guess only a brain scientist can decide that. I read about a case, I mean, we have, as everybody knows, a left and a right brain half, which are connected. Um, I think the right one was the more emotional one and the left one was the more rational thinking one. But I read about a case where through some accident there's a person where they're disconnected. So the left half doesn't know what the right half thinks. And now the question would be, is that really only one person or is it actually two persons in one body? Um, and which I don't one's, know. Which one's speaking? <laughs> exactly, and then probably the, the 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 speaking one would be the left rational part. That's but then there's also the feeling person, and the the feeling person doesn't know what the speaking person is saying. So would we consider these two pe persons well two? And if that body commits a crime, which which person is responsible for the crime? Uh, I I don't know. Um, I don't know, but I think for most of us, when the brain, these two brain halves are connected, um, we can only imagine a state where there's another consciousness, which I don't know about, but which is also controlling somehow parts of my body. Or we could imagine that maybe I have another consciousness sitting in my thigh. Sometimes that happens. Yeah. My, my dad always said, um, let the big head do the thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and which part of our brain needs to be active for self-consciousness to take place? I don't know. I don't know, but... Hmm. I mean, that's, that's kind of uh, a mystery to me, but the fact that obviously each brain has more or less one consciousness. And for some reason, the brain of Muho has the consciousness that I call my consciousness. Why? Why is that? I don't know. Where's I, the line between hmm. Muho and Thomas? Exactly, exactly. I mean, okay, well, there's some air, but I mean, it's all part of some quantum soup, basically. On a quantum level, we are, we're com connected. We're basically the same Schrödinger's cats. Um, one kind of wave, kind of quantum wave that extends through the whole universe. How come that, yeah, there's Thomas and there's Muho and both have a brain, but only one is conscious. Or if anybody's watching our conversation, that person will be conscious, but not of what Thomas is conscious of and not what I am conscious of, but what is happening in your brain? Why? What's, what makes the difference between these three brains? What is so special about that third brain that makes it conscious? Because probably from a scientific point of view, these three brains are not so different. Uh, but from the personal point of view, there's a huge difference. That... Oh, Both Thomas and me hear the wind right now in this moment, the birds, but only one of them really hears them, and that's me. <laughs> Thomas doesn't really hear them. Uh, he, he, he might think he hears them. But <laughs> and probably from Thomas' side, it's the same with him. Muho will also hear the sounds, but only he really hears them. And the same is true for you. But uh, I mean, that's, that's not an answer to the question. That's a non-answer to a question that wasn't asked in the first place. <laughs> but I think it's funny mm. that mm. if I hear the birds, I assume you hear the birds. Yes. Otherwise, the whole conversation wouldn't make sense. Yeah. Mm. 
And I don't know what's happening with the mics, you know, uh, if the audiences have heard birds during our conversation or not. <laughs> Yeah, with the mic, the assumption that maybe the mic doesn't work makes sense because that can sometimes happen. But the assumption that maybe Thomas is only a robot and all I'm saying right now, I'm talking to myself, the assumption doesn't really make much sense because I couldn't live my life as I do if I really earnestly would think that's a possibility. So you don't read science fiction, but you just make it up in conversations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe. Uh, I'm so dissatisfied with most science fiction that I've encountered so far because, at least in my mind, it doesn't really get to the level where it starts to get interesting. I think a lot of uh, interesting science fiction, mm. it's not actually about the science. Yeah. It's not actually about the setting. Yeah. Uh, it's just to make the interesting backdrop or situation for then the human interactions mm, mm, that are mm. the human dramas that are playing out on that stage mm, mm. Um, in a way to make it more like you could uh, use it to make a commentary about current political events without specifically naming a political politician or a political party you know mm, this mm, mm, figure mm. represents mm, that mm, person mm, mm. Uh, and certainly there's a lot of I would say there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot more musings about what, when you start having science fiction that involves artificial intelligence or robots, yeah. robots fighting for their human rights, it starts to create the situation where you can ask, well, what is, what does it mean to be human and what is consciousness or where do we draw the line between, um, like, will we give rights to artificial intelligence or not mm, mm, mm. and if we don't will they uh, take us over <laughs> yeah yeah this kind of can robots be conscious also an interesting topic almost a decade ago i think in antis we have this movie night once a year or so and somebody i forgot the name wanted me to see this movie of a guy falling in love with, I don't know, one or two women. And what was the point of the story? I think she turned out to be a robot or something like that. But again, in my point of view, the movie would have been much more interesting if the guy would have fallen in love with a woman, but then he realizes out of a sudden, actually, I was a robot. He didn't realize until then. He thought he was also a human being, but then he realizes I'm a robot. What do I do with that realization? To realize the girl is actually a robot, it's not so interesting. It could be the case that you fall in love with a robot and who knows? I mean, uh, some, some people might fall in, in love with uh, Siri or Alexa or whatever. It's, it's possible or with the navigator of your car. There's but, a movie about that called Her. I see, I see. The man but, falls but, in love with his personal assistant. Yeah, yeah. but like uh, much more interesting would be, from my perspective, and uh, how would it be to wake up and realize I'm the robot, I'm the robot. The robots are not out there, but actually I'm a robot. Or a Buddha. Does it mean I don't have a consciousness? <laughs> what, yeah, if the, what if the robot wakes up and, and realizes that it was a Buddha? Yeah, in a way, that there's this connection. In Buddhism, we say there's no self. There's no self. And enlightenment means to realize you have no self. There's no self. But then what is this? <laughs> what is this? What are these sounds? What is this image of Thomas and this person here having a conversation. If it's not self, well, what do I call that? A lot of those languages, mm. a lot of the language in Buddhism and in Zen mm. always has to be taken with a grain of salt. Mm. Of right? course, of course. Because yeah. mm. I guess it comes to the it got, it's kind of like related to the two truths doctrine mm, mm, mm. where you're like 
yes, I don't exist, and yes, I also pragmatically exist. Mm. Mm. <laughs> right? it, from the standpoint of ultimate reality, there is no Thomas, but from the standpoint of day-to-day -day life in Japan, with the government wanting taxes, there's definitely a Thomas. Mm. 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 <laughs> and his taxes are due. Yeah. Or uh, back to the Tao Te Ching, it's like, okay, you've, you've asserted that you can't talk about this thing, and now you, you've written a whole book about it. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, two truths. It's kind of it's a convenient, convenient way to somehow try to put it into order. Although, even talking about two truths, you don't really get rid of the contradiction because, well, to talk about two truths, you need the relative truths, relative truth, and that's everything that can be covered with words. But then you say there's something that's beyond the relative truth, absolute truth, and that cannot be explained in words. And a lot of people suppose that that's the real, the real thing, and relative truth is only illusory, whatever. Um, but this explanation, this division is already relative. To say relative truth is here, absolute truth is over there, is already relative truth. Mm. In um, Tendai or Tiantai, mm. they have a three truths doctrine, mm -hmm. which is, okay, the first two. Yeah. And the third one is neither of them and also both of them at the same time. Yeah, and then you have the three lined up, and so you need a fourth one to frame them. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, uh, I guess, I mean, Nagarjuna is this thing that A and not B, B and not A, both A and B, neither A and B. Right. But then from a logical point of view, you would also say both A and B and neither A and B. And you also have to say, well, then, then there's also nor, neither A and B nor not A and B, and then you can go on for, forever, basically. Um, At some point, it gets ridiculous, right? It, you it, just gets, have to... it gets ridiculous. <laughs> so from a kind of, how do you say, a pragmatic point of view, you could also say, well, maybe relative truth in the first place, maybe it's already enough. Um, maybe the at the point where we start to talk about absolute truth we're already falling in the trap here it seems like if uh, if you had a student mm. in a classical text i don't know what would happen mm. today but in a classical setting yeah if the student went to the zen master and proclaimed something about them not being real mm -mm. then the master would slap them and then mm. they'd be mm. like who's feeling the pain yeah 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 <laughs> right Uh, it's it's a it's a frustrating situation as a student to be in, where no matter what you say is wrong. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> and, and, and that's why you end up with sandals on your head. <laughs> just... Well, I don't know so calm and nice right now maybe that's a good good place to end it mm -hmm. uh i have one final question yes please does a dog have buddha nature <laughs> <laughs> uh thank you so much for your time today it's been a pleasure i'm i'm mm -hmm. really happy we could do this and mm. if people want to follow you on well, oh, you know, here's the, here's the one thing before we end it. Uh, yeah, this there's one thing I would like to say before we end. And you mm. are, I would say, much more involved with social media than um, most monks. Mm, mm, mm. You do live streams sometimes. Mm, mm. Every uh, every Sunday, you're to, when the internet gods allow, you're mm, streaming uh, 
uh, an hour of Zen meditation from Osaka Castle. Mm. Um, you do Zoom meeting, online classes. Uh, you 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 make jokes on Twitter. <laughs> In Japanese language, mostly. Yeah. I, there's a translate button, so I just hit it, and I'm like, oh, that, was, that was funny. <laughs> you know? uh, that's the best part of of uh, Twitter is the translate button mm -hmm. at the bottom of it. I don't know if you see that. Mm, maybe I saw it, but I, I usually don't hit it so much. Yeah. yeah. Like if you see it. I guess I guess you would ignore it because like oh I can understand the English so I don't need to translate. It I mean to on Japanese. YouTube you also have these automatic translated subs and can also be quite humorous. Yeah. Especially if it's a talk on Dogen or something and you translate it into a foreign language it's kind of dataistic <laughs> result. Do you want to share your Twitter handles or your Yeah, I mean my Muho is my monk's name, and my family name is Nölke, uh, N-O-E-L-K-E. -E. If you Google that, you should find me on both YouTube as well as Twitter. On Twitter, usually I tweet in Japanese. On YouTube, I do some English stuff, but it's mostly German. But yeah, you can find some English videos there as well. Um... I mean, if you publish, how do you say, publish this something, maybe you put a link somewhere. Uh, there's definitely going to be links in the description. Yeah, that's yeah. for sure. Do you want to come back to that uh, Buddha nature question once more? Or is that answer enough for you? <laughs> it seems such a, uh, that's a slippery, uh, that's such a slippery question. But it, it why, does... why is it a slippery question? Well, it's the, it's like the main, the main koan, right? Mm, mm. I mean, I mean the, the, the question, I don't know what the, the monk had is in his mind. I don't know if it was this kind of theoretical interest that according to Mahayana Buddhism, all living beings have Buddha nature, but looking at the dog, it doesn't really look like a Buddha. Is it possible that this dog also has Buddha nature? And if yes, where is it? How come that the Buddha doesn't look more like Avolokiteshvara or what, uh, whatever. Um, but I think that the point of the question is, do I have Buddha nature? How about me? Sitting in Zazen, there are all these random thoughts and there is this sexual desire that comes up, I think, more about girls than I think about enlightenment. Does a, even that person like myself, have Buddha nature. And maybe the monk just hoped that the master would say, yes, even somebody like you, even a dog, has Buddha nature. So, sure, you will reach enlightenment if you just continue to practice. But uh, the master famously said, Muh. and some people say maybe he was just imitating the barking of the dog, because in Chinese it's Muh. Uh, maybe, uh, but maybe he just said no. So he was, was taking away everything from the monk, that hope to get some kind of affirmation. Yeah, you have Buddha nature. Chill, chill. You will reach enlightenment sooner or later. It's just no, no speck of Buddha nature in you. And then, and that's the, the kind of koan. So what do you do then? if the master takes away your Buddha nature. What do you do? I mean, you want to become a Buddha. I you mean, want to be a Buddha. You either go home or you keep sitting. Hmm. Well, those are the two choices, I suppose. Yeah. Sit anyways. Hmm. So I guess the point of the koan is, well, show me your Buddha nature. Don't talk about dogs or cats. Where's your Buddha nature? Don't come to me and ask me about it. Show it to me. That's basically the point of that koan. Mm. Mm. So that's what I meant when I did this. So, so show me. Oh, show well. me. <laughs> you show me. I couldn't show you anything without <laughs> acting right now. 
Oh, you can act. <laughs> the camera's running. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Kawaii! <laughs> <laughs> That's more cat's Buddha nature. <laughs> <laughs> Meow. <Yeah. laughs> mm. Still running? Yeah. Good. I thought ending it just in this very weird way is probably the best. Yeah, yeah, why not? <laughs> Turn it off. Suddenly. And that's how I always well, do it. I think so. In this case. Uh, that's kind of Muho style, yeah. <laughs> Just turn it off. 